Update your Nintendo account security now. Researchers use GIFs or GIFs to hack Microsoft Teams, and a critical Apple iOS mail bug is patched. All that coming up now on ThreatWire. Greetings, I am Shannon Morris, and this is ThreatWire for April 28th, 2020. This is your summary of the threats to our security, privacy, and internet freedom. We're gonna get right into the news with the first story, and props to Joel on the Patreon community tab for recommending this story. If you used to own, or you still have, a Nintendo 3DS or a Wii U, there's a high possibility that your Nintendo account could be vulnerable to account hijackings due to a legacy deprecated account called a Nintendo network ID. In early April, many Nintendo account holders were alerting users via social media that something weird was going on, with hackers accessing and using payment card info that was attached to said accounts to steal hundreds of dollars of Fortnite currency as well as currency used on digital add-ons and other Nintendo games. Now, while originally users were advised to just change their passwords, many reported that they never used their passwords anywhere else, so they could not be from some other data leak. And even after changing passwords, hackers still had access. So users ruled out credential stuffing attacks. I had updated my Nintendo account in early April due to this rumor going around on Twitter about Nintendo accounts being hacked, at which time I found out that two-factor authentication is also available on Nintendo, so so obviously I added that as well before kind of just forgetting about that account because I never use it. I had never used an NNID account either, so I wasn't vulnerable in the first place, but it's always good to add 2FA. Well, it turns out that this was a pretty serious problem for Nintendo though, as they finally acknowledged on Friday that up to 160,000 people's accounts have been accessed, allowing attackers access to player nicknames, date of birth, regions, email addresses, and unauthorized digital purchases. So Nintendo reported that the hack occurred because older Nintendo network IDs, those NNIDs, were connected to the newer Nintendo accounts totally different names, and somehow, Nintendo did not specify how, attackers were abusing that integration to gain access to not only the NNID, but newer Nintendo accounts as well. So many suspect attackers gained access to the NNIDs because accounts had to be created on older resistive screen keyboards on those older consoles, so passwords were really easy to guess, and they weren't complicated. Attackers likely used that constraint to brute force NNID creds, thereby finding ones that were now connected to new Nintendo IDs. Since users connected them and probably forgot about them, even if they changed their password on the Nintendo account, the NNID would remain connected. And since NNID's passwords can't be changed without using a Wii U or a 3DS, it's tough for a user to update that old legacy account if they don't have an older console anymore. Now, according to some reports, you could use a browser to reset the NNID, but the new password would only be eight characters, chosen by Nintendo, and send via plain text to your email address. That whole thing is a big ball of yikes. Now, originally, Nintendo alerted users of new sign-ins to their Nintendo accounts with an email that noted that they could change their password for the Nintendo account if they didn't recognize the new login attempt. But that, again, did not fix the problem. A user would need to add two-factor authentication as well to their Nintendo account, which does keep attackers from logging in, and they can also unlink their NNID from the Nintendo account, but Nintendo did not tell them that they should do this. To unlink them, you go into your Nintendo account sign-in, you click user info, scroll down to linked accounts, click edit, and then click the check mark next to Nintendo Network ID, which will remove that link. To make matters even more confusing, if you used your NNID to create the new Nintendo account way back in the day, you have to link a new service like Twitter or go ahead and create a Nintendo account password before you can remove the link, which could obviously be frustrating for users to figure out probably making them just not want to deal with the whole thing in the first place. Now, in Friday's post, the company said that they are deprecating the ability to log into Nintendo accounts using NNIDs, and passwords will be reset automatically for those NNIDs, and Nintendo accounts that may have been compromised were alerted. 
Zoom is not the only video conferencing tool that has experienced security flaws ever since the pandemic began. Microsoft has also experienced this with their team's workplace video and collaboration platform, where an attacker would just need to send a malicious link to an image to take control over the organization's account. This would include gaining access to confidential information like meetings and calendar info, passwords, any kind of proprietary info that is shared between members of a business's team's account. This flaw impacts both desktop and web versions of Teams, and the problem was disclosed by CyberArk on March 23rd, with Microsoft patching the flaw on April 20th, about a month later. Now, it's always fun to take a look at how these attacks work, so I'm gonna go ahead and break it down. Microsoft Teams had this flaw due to how it handles authentication of image resources, which allowed CyberArk to take advantage of a subdomain takeover vulnerability. An access token, which is called a JSON web token, or JWT for short, is created each time the application is open, and that allows users to view images shared between team members, as well as get access to things like SharePoint and Outlook. All pretty normal. An auth token cookie gives access to a resource server, which is called api.spaces.skype.com. And this was used by those researchers at CyberArk to create a Skype token that would allow them to change permissions on the account. Also allowing them to do things like send and receive messages, create groups, or even add or remove users all within that Teams API. This cookie also gets sent to subdomains for teams.microsoft.team, and two of those subdomains were also vulnerable to takeover attacks. A user could be tricked into visiting one of those subdomains, at which time the auth cookie would be sent to an attacker server, and this would allow the attacker to create that Skype token, which would allow them to gain access and steal data from the team's platform. So how does the attacker actually trick the user? Well, it's pretty easy. Apparently, they could just send a malicious link to an image file like a GIF or a GIF. I don't care either way. Y'all can fight about it in the comments below. Using that chat functionality, that image would attempt to load, but the link would also activate the auth token cookie. Now, CyberArk did not note any use of this attack in the wild, although it is highly critical to patch. So to fix this issue, Microsoft just simply deleted misconfigured DNS records for the two vulnerable domains. That's it, that's all they did to fix it, and it worked. Before we hit story number three, I wanted to say thank you so much to my Patreon supporters over at patreon.com slash threatwire. My hush puppy perk level patrons are awesome for sending in their new fur baby photos. I love them. Keep them coming. And if you want to support Threatwire, but you don't want to be a Patreon supporter, that's fine. Check out snubsy.com slash shop to get t-shirts, some really cool Threatwire stickers. I love my Trust Your Technola sticker. It's my favorite. And even my own digital photography, all of which supports my show. According to a blog post by San Francisco-based security company ZecOps, a vulnerability in Apple's Mail app could allow for remote code execution attacks as well as remotely infecting a device simply by sending an email that uses up a whole bunch of memory. ZecOps reported that this vulnerability has existed since at least iOS 6. That means it's been around since 2012. But it was used in the wild since January of 2018 against at least six high-profile targets. Now, ZecOps also has not obtained malicious code for this vulnerability. They believe this is because attackers are able to delete email messages connected to the attacks, but they were able to recreate the attacks in a lab environment. The attack occurs whenever a criminal sends a malicious email to a victim through their iOS mail application, and the application incorrectly handles the return value for system calls, resulting in two different bugs. One of those is an out-of-bounds write bug, and the other one is a heap overflow bug. The target user does not need to download any files or click on any links. The mail app just needs to receive the email, and the victim opens the email message. The attack can be triggered even before the entire email is downloaded to the device. 
Apple responded to ZecOps reports saying that this vulnerability had not been exploited in the wild and they found no proof of any users being targeted in this kind of attack. Apple and some security researchers disputed ZecOps claims, saying the report may have just seen malformed emails that triggered the bug, not active attacks. Now, while Apple disputed the vulnerabilities being used for attacks against customers in the wild, they did end up patching the flaw anyway in the newest beta release of iOS, which is version 13.4.5, with a non-beta update to be pushed in the next few weeks. You can disable mail and use an alternate email app for the time being. Now, before I leave, I want to say thank you so much to Samurai and Abstraction who joined the Patreon team this week. Thank you to both of you. You are awesome. And if you are looking for some more geeky content, I wanted to mention this. I just posted a really, really fun video over on my own channel about the last actively transmitting commercially used Morse code radio station in the US that I got to visit way back before the pandemic began, obviously. It's where amateur hams like myself can go in California and even try your own hand at Morse code. It was incredibly fun, super historical, super geeky. I will just put the link in the description below. If I remember, I'll put a thing up here that you can click on. Trust me, you will love it. And with that, do not forget to like and subscribe. I'm Shannon Morse, and I will see you on the internet.